Coming up in today's newscast, Prime Minister Netanyahu makes an interesting address from the Dimona nuclear reactor. A shocking report finds that Israeli schools are lacking any education in the theory of evolution, and a new Israeli treatment could turn out to be the best offense against acute myeloid leukemia. Prime Minister Netanyahu made a trip south yesterday for the renaming of the Dimona nuclear reactor in honor of the late Israeli uh, leader Shimon Peres. But Netanyahu took the opportunity to make a very symbolic threat to Israel's enemies too. While standing in front of the site where most believe Israel is stockpiling nuclear weapons, the Prime Minister said that anyone hoping to eradicate the Jewish state would only face eradication themselves. <laughs> להציב כוחות ומערכות נשק מתקדמות בסוריה, ושום הסכם בין סוריה ואיראן לא ירתיע אותנו. וגם שום איום לא ירתיע אותנו. מי שמאיים עלינו בכליה, מעמיד עצמו בסכנה דומה. ובכל מקרה, הוא לא ישיג את מטרתו. Considering where Netanyahu made this edict, these words are back with a bit of veiled truth. For many years now, Israel has maintained a vague policy on neither confirming nor denying its nuclear capabilities. But it's widely believed that the country has stockpiled dozens, if not hundreds, of nuclear warheads. If true, this obviously gives Israel a serious defensive backbone. But the Israeli government has also received flack for hiding this project from the world and refusing to sign the non-proliferation treaty. Some have pointed out a contradiction in the fact that Israel continues to rally against the JCPOA nuclear deal with Iran while maintaining an undisclosed nuclear arsenal themselves. But Israeli leaders would likely argue that its military only acts in self-defense. Iran's current leaders, on the other hand, continue to demand the destruction of the state of Israel. The regime's research into nuclear development in the 2000s, as well as its funding of terror cells surrounding the Jewish state, are ample evidence of this objective. And the IDF has conducted repeated attacks abroad in order to keep this effort at bay. Syrian government forces, with the help of Iran and Russia, have essentially cleared the embattled Syrian country of rebel forces and terrorist organizations like the Islamic State. Now, all that remains is the alleged rebel stronghold of Idlib, against which pro regime and Russian forces are reportedly preparing a massive attack. Western powers like France and the United States have backed many of the rebel groups including those in Idlib, and although a call to halt all hostilities has been largely mute, the West has at least urged Syria and Russia not to allow the use of chemical weapons in their upcoming assault. They even threatened retaliation for such acts. But Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has responded, asking the West to basically butt out. The гражданское население и которые пытаются э, подмять под себя вооруженные формирования, готовые к переговорам с правительством. Так что со всех точек зрения этот гнойник необходимо ликвидировать. Returning now to the studio to discuss is Dr. Mordechai Kedar, expert on the Middle East from the Begin Sadat Center at Bar Ilan University. Thank you so much for uh, rejoining us. All right, so uh, again, as I said earlier, Russia, pro-regime forces, Iran, they've pretty much cleared house in Syria, right? Uh, and this attack in Idlib, if, if it goes on as planned, is pretty much going to go one way, all right? You know, people are, are expecting a massacre. But then what next? What comes next? Well, first of all, it will be a massacre, and we already know it. it means that the world, which does nothing against it, actually allows it. And Russia feels that it's open. The places uh, and, and the blood of these unfortunate people is allowed, and they can do whatever they like, only because the world doesn't say anything against it. This is one thing. Second thing, many of them will actually run away. Maybe they started already. Do they have yeah. somewhere to go? Yes. First of all, they can go to the north, to Turkey. But Turkey will not keep them. Turkey will send them to Europe. And there will very possibly be another wave of refugees who will come from Syria, through Turkey, to Greece, and to, and to Europe. And this is something which I'm not sure that the Europeans want to create or want to agree with this. So again, we're going to see atrocities in the sea where ships are being sent with, loaded with people from Turkey while the Europeans do not let them land. 
And this will be a repetition of what we saw in 2014-15. Okay, so again, why do you think this, this inaction or this uh, kind of muted response from the West, wh why do you think we have a muted response from the West? Why aren't people being more vocal and saying, cut it out, you basically won, you know, let's end the hostilities, let's not exacerbate the problem, let's not send hundreds if not thousands of more people, you know, fleeing. Look, the Syrian regime, the Iranians which support them, the Hezbollah, and of course the, the Russians, they do not listen to anyone. They couldn't care less about what the Europeans says and say. And uh, I'm, in my humble view, they don't even count what Trump tells them, if he tells them. So when the Europeans say nothing, and the Americans, more or less, they don't want to get involved in these issues. So the Russians and the, and the regime, with the support of the Iranians, feel that they can do whatever they like to these poor people. Not the jihadists, but the civilians, hundreds of thousands of civilians who originally lived in those places or fled to this enclave of Iblim as some kind of safe haven from other parts of the country because they know that this part is still not under the, uh, uh, the, the regime. So uh, what, will, what will happen to them? These poor people who are actually waiting their death only because the world says nothing against the Syrian regime and the Russians which support him. So, okay, so that kind of brings us back to the Russians, as you've just mentioned. You know, they, they've kind of started to fill this role of a linchpin of sorts, where they, you know, they're this intermediary between the West and, and Syria and Iran at times, and even with Israel and Iran or Syria. Uh, and, you know, they're saying they're, they're helping Syrian forces while at the same time allowing Israeli strikes and preemptive strikes against Iran. You know, what are their motives? I think that the Russians actually act like a mattress to uh, that all the criticism, everything against the regime will stop this mattress. And they actually protect him. And uh, Assad does whatever he likes because the Russians are behind him. And if there, any, if there is any criticism against what happens in Syria, they actually take it upon themselves. And nobody messes with the Russians these days because they proved for some years that they actually do what others do not. And uh, unfortunately, this is how Russia became actually the master of Syria and in other places of the Middle East, people understand that America doesn't want to get involved. Europe has no way to, to, in, to get involved. And everybody actually worships the Russians only because they do what they can and they can what they want. All right, Dr. Kedal, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us again. Following a relative calm along the Gaza border, talks between Israel, Hamas, and Egypt on a potential long-term ceasefire still remain in limbo. Hamas leaders are claiming that while negotiations are indeed still underway, the terror group would launch a cascade of rockets if and when those discussions fall apart, an act that would most likely spiral the region into a new all-out war. The fate and very nature of these ceasefire talks has put regional allies and rivals at odds like never before. First and foremost is the fact that Hamas stands to gain a lot of credibility and authority if it indeed lands a ceasefire deal with Israel. An emboldened Hamas would potentially stand to steal a lot of influence from Palestinian Authority President Abbas's Fatah party in the West Bank. Needless to say, this is not exactly a favorable outcome for Israel nor the United States. But following rumors that the Trump administration is set to halt all funding to UNRWA, the United Nations Palestinian Refugee Agency, this too would potentially give Hamas a major boost in the Palestinian world. Abbas, meanwhile, has begun to reinvigorate himself on the global stage amidst the sense that his power may soon be shifting to Hamas. The sense is that Abbas is actively trying to thwart the Gaza ceasefire deal in an effort to maintain control. This places both the United States and Israel at a somewhat complicated crossroads, though. On one hand, the White House has firmly backed Egyptian efforts to de-escalate violence against Israel on the Gaza front with Hamas. On the other hand, American Ambassador David Friedman has urged Jewish leaders that such a deal could be catastrophic if it means cutting out the PA in favor of Hamas. Needless to say, these contradictory statements from the Trump administration are signals of a somewhat confused White House with respect to its Middle East policy and protocol. Israeli leaders also warned that recent U.S. policy shifts may indeed be playing directly into Hamas's hands. Six months ago, many believed that the terror group was on its last limbs on the precipice of collapse. But half a year later, signs are indicating that Hamas may soon be on its way to becoming the new leadership face of the Palestinians. Israel's education is under fire following new reports that teachers across the country are apparently being told to avoid the topic of evolution altogether. Indeed, school curriculum in Israel was reformed in recent years, 
and at this time, even the word evolution is largely absent from the newest edition of biology textbooks. LTV's Brett Allen Smith joins me to discuss this. Now, Brett, first off, where are these reports coming from? Thanks, Aaron. So, yeah, these stories are mostly coming from the, the teachers themselves. Um, from what I understand, a growing number of teachers have stressed that the, you know, the government from the, the education ministry have basically implied that they need to avoid that topic of evolution altogether in the classrooms. And further to that, their training now allegedly no longer includes any preparation on how to present evolution or teach it to, its, to their students. And reports even said that in elementary schools you don't find evolution in the textbooks at all. In middle school those words do appear in some books, though not everywhere, and if they do it's only as a part of a separate discussion topic altogether where the curriculum used to focus on the theory of evolution, now there's a section on genetic modifications and environmental adoption instead. So yeah, if these accounts are true, that would mean that evolution has been almost universally wiped out from schools um, altogether. All right, so let's address that. You know, evolution, like so much of science, mm -hmm. is of course just a theory. But as evidence has mounted supporting evolution, that theory has indeed become the fundamental backbone of how science explains life on planet Earth. You know, it's a theory deeply rooted in proven science. And a scientific lingo, uh, in scientific lingo rather, a theory is really the best supported idea unless right. something better comes right. along. You know, it doesn't, it, you know, we're not using the theory like in layman's term where it's like, ah, oh, it's just theoretical. Right, like, no, no, it's, it's sustained theory. Exactly. Yeah. But the religious people in any religion, you know, uh, say that, you know, scientific explanation sometimes defies the literal interpretation of man's origins mm -hmm. in the Old Testament. Uh, people who take the Bible literally would therefore believe that mankind and the earth is only a few thousand years old as opposed to millions of years old according to science. Right. Uh, and that's why the topic of evolution itself is a controversial one in Israel. Right, and so to illustrate that, uh, I want to share some statistics that we just got in. So as of 2016, half, half of the Jews in Israel believed in that theory of evolution. Half. <laughs> and that was before the curriculum was changed by the education ministry. And I got to remind you something else, by the way. At the same time that students are not now, not learning evolution, they are taking another class that's always been there, religious studies, Torah studies. That's a mandatory part of every Israeli curriculum regardless of your religion. So now Israel is pretty unique, right, in that respect because obviously in the U.S. there's, you know, a fundamental separation of church and state in sure. public schools. But in Israel they don't make that separation or that distinction. Those institutions are quite merged. And one of the results of that so far has been that, you know, you have at least half the country of Jews believing a literal reading of the Bible, the Old Testament, over a widely believed scientific theory. So I'm not here to say whether that's a good thing or a bad thing or you should believe this, shouldn't believe that, but I, I am here to say that this is what the education ministry even kind of says that they want. In response to these allegations of excluding evolution, the ministry has said that the theory of evolution itself is taught as an optional class in high schools. Optional in high school only. So I think that those statements say a lot about what they want kids to sure. learn and not to learn, perhaps. Sure, and, and again, you know, I want to stress something that you said, which is that it, this isn't necessarily a matter of fundamental uh, right versus fundamental wrong, sure. but totally. you know, evolution, evolution is a critical theory, not because it has anything to do with us existentially, right. but it, it's because it's a backbone of so many other scientific studies, and therefore progress. Right. So you know, we don't want our Israeli society to be missing out and getting left behind in scientific discourse. Right. Uh, in any event, Thanks for the report, Brett. The makers of Kentucky Fried Chicken have just announced, finally, that yes, at long last, KFC is set to make a tasty and triumphant return to Israel. The food chain struggled in Israel in the past because of the, the taste of the kosher-certified KFC. Uh, but with rumors of a new recipe surfacing, hopefully that means Kentucky Fried Bliss is just around the corner. Until now, the closest place for Israelis craving KFC to find it has been the Palestinian city of Ramallah in the West Bank. Now, for Israelis, it's illegal to enter the West Bank, but to demonstrate just how powerful KFC is, there are many Israelis who have indeed illegally snuck across the Green Line and entered Ramallah just to buy a bucket of the Colonel's legendary chicken. It's true. Once upon a time, KFC had about a dozen or so restaurants scattered all over Israel, but the company pulled the plug back in 2013 because Israelis just weren't digging the kosher modified recipe. The super secret formula is apparently milk-based, prompting Colonel Sanders to swap out the milk for soy-based products in compliance with kosher certification laws. But that was 2013, and this is 2018. The dawn of a new age, an age where Israelis all over the country will finally be able to satisfy that fried chicken urge by grabbing a bucket or two. Representatives from KFC just visited Israel ahead of the official announcement, and the idea is to open 100 restaurants in the country over the next five years. 
No confirmed date yet on when we can expect the first chain to officially open up shop, but if the recent return of Burger King to Israel is any indicator, we can probably expect a long line of hungry Israelis when that finally happens. Welcome back, Colonel Sanders. Oh, how we've been waiting. All right, now on a related note, I don't know about you, but I'm almost always in the mood for some pastries and other confectionery goodies. But sometimes, at least for observant Jews, such morsels are outside our grasp. Take French pastries, for example, which you might assume were either parve or dairy, I know I did, but actually they typically contain gelatin that isn't kosher. Well, the Maven Baker Kosher French Pastries from Florida is answering the call and now joining me with more is the Maven Baker herself, Chef Jennifer Schwartz. Chef Schwartz, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, my pleasure. And bringing this and the smell with it, that's just (laughs) incredible. People at home will just have to appreciate how gorgeous it is, but but yeah, I mean, it smells incredible. Thank you. Um, All right, so walk us through. What what do we have here? Let's start there. Okay, so in honor of the upcoming holiday of Rosh Hashanah, uh, we have the apple and honey theme. Mm. So we have our Pièce de la Résistance, which is the apple spice cake. Um, so we have a spice buttercream, we have fresh apples in the cake, and then we have a salted honey caramel on top. And that's, that's this guy here in the this is This oh, is this one. Oh, this wow. is this one. Then we have um, an apple streusel babka, and then our French delicacy, which is an apple tart. Oh man. All right. And so, you know, kind of what brought you towards making these kosher, you know, kosher desserts? Because aren't there other kosher desserts, you know? <laughs> you know. So what made me make these in particular mm. is that uh, we always try to keep things very modern in our bakery. Uh, we are changing things up. We change desserts all the time because mm. we keep with the seasons. We use fresh uh, ingredients and produce. And so that is specifically with the fall holiday that we have sure. these things in front of us. And is it, I mean, kosher, obviously, but like gluten free or, or dairy free, par, you know, what are, we, what are we talking about here? So. Everything we have here is parv. We don't have gluten-free, although we do have a line of gluten-free, okay. both cakes and tarts. So this in particular is something that we make that's completely gluten-free and you can't even tell the difference. Oh, man. Had people tell me that specifically. Oh. And like vegan friendly options, things like that too? Vegan friendly, we do everything. Um, Mm. Most of our clientele is parv, so mostly we try to keep in touch with a parv pastry. Man, all right. Now, so I know, I understand that you also have another, you know, you've reopened. Uh, correct. You've closed your Boca location, you've reopened now in Hollywood, Florida. That is correct. Uh, and And you have another service with that. That's, yes. So we also have a kosher gourmet chef, which Mm. is a side business that is a private chef where specifically we come to your house or we go to your vacation house, we fly, we drive, whatever you want. We create a menu just for you. We bring uh, kosher food and we cook it on the spot. Oh man, all right, well, the Maven Baker, follow her on Instagram, find her in in Hollywood, California, order some sweets. I have to try something. Absolutely. I'm just gonna, you know, let I'll let you pick. You surprise me, okay. but uh, you know, I think, we, I think we're gonna we're gonna cut into the cake. Let's do that. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So again, it smells incredible, and this is this is you said this was a this was a chocolate and apple. This is caramel? apple spice cake, and then we have a buttercream, and then a salted honey caramel on oh top. <laughs> I like. I can't. Contain myself. I'm, I'm very giddy right now. It's uh, it's like embarrassing a little bit. As neatly as we yeah, can. Very professional <laughs> in the service. Oh my god. Wow. Okay. okay. I'm gonna need a fork too. <laughs> Absolutely. As much as I'd love to stuff this <laughs> in my face. All right. I'm gonna start at the top because I want to try this this amazing uh, crust here, and then uh, and then we're gonna go to commercial. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> Is it good? Again, Hollywood, Florida, everybody. <laughs> Hollywood, Florida. This is this is amazing. Thank like, you. Really amazing. I'm gonna take one more bite and then unfortunately we do have to we we're gonna have to end it, but wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh 
The Maven Baker, <laughs> Chef Jennifer Schwartz. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. I would you. shake your hand, I have some, but I have chocolate no. on me now. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming in. My pleasure. All right, now, it's no secret that just about everyone is obsessed with Fauda, the hit Israeli TV series about secret Mossad spies and the terrorists they hunt, and it just premiered its second season to worldwide acclaim. Well then, this next story should come as an amazing news to all of you young aspiring filmmakers out there. The head screenwriter of Fauda will be teaching at Rutgers University this coming fall semester to spill all of his classified writing tips and advice to the next generation of screenwriters. Now for most TV series, especially one as complex as Fauda, the duty of writing each and every episode is typically shared by a collection of writers called the writer's room. But leading the chain of command is typically someone called the head writer, uh, and the man or woman responsible for keeping every episode in line with the others and for ratcheting up that tension to an all-time max. Well, Moshe Zander is the head writer for Fauda, and news that he'll be teaching a semester of screenwriting at Rutgers U is obviously a pretty huge reason to sign up for film school. This was made possible due to an initiative called the Visiting Israeli Artists Program, which is run by the Israel Institute in Washington, D.C., and that group has been bringing Israeli representatives from the arts to America since 2008. But this is arguably one of their all-time biggest scores yet. Zonder is one of the country's most sought-after, and likely soon to be one of Hollywood's, A-listers uh, as well. Now, following the massive success of Fauda on Netflix, Zonder's demand for more original work has exploded, and right now he's working on a new TV series about futuristic Israel in which a dystopian king is building a third temple in the holy capital. And at the same time, he has another series about Israel's efforts to pull the plug on Iran's efforts to build a nuclear warhead. Needless to say, it's pretty amazing that he's managed to squeeze professor duties in there too in an otherwise jam-packed schedule. Acute myeloid leukemia is one of the most aggressive, most awful cancers currently known. The disease grows incredibly fast, metastasizes in our most delicate human tissues, and worse, it can adapt to drugs at record speeds. There's still a long way to go in the fight against AML, but one Israeli team says that they now have a new treatment which could be the key to saving millions of lives in the future. Roughly a million people all over the world have been diagnosed with AML, and tragically, survival rates for patients, even those strong enough for the intense chemotherapy currently being used, is pretty low. Roughly two-thirds of patients under the age of 60 will die from this disease. But here's a bit of good news and, you know, where that comes in. Israeli researchers at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem say that they've just developed an incredible new treatment that overcomes AML's biggest defense. AML has long managed to elude treatment because the disease can basically summon new cancer cells in the area to attack drugs and then assimilates them. But this new breakthrough is more of a cluster bomb effect. Uh, the, the drug targets multiple leukemia cells simultaneously disintegrating neighboring cancer cells before they can attack, and the treatment has just had some very promising results in testing. 50% of the lab rats affiliated with AML recovered completely from their cancer after receiving this treatment. While effects in lab rats don't necessarily translate 100% of the time into human results, doctors have never seen results like these as far as AML goes, and obviously it raises hopes that a human cure can be found. Needless to say, millions of patients and their families are probably praying that this indeed turns out to be the case. We're all crossing our fingers. All right, now for our Hebrew word of the day. For some, it's just another topic that you get tested on in school, but for others, it's a deep, complicated controversy. I'm talking, of course, about evolutia or evolution. So evolutia or evolution is the scientific theory that suggests how organisms evolved over millions and millions of years into their current forms. Not just the evolutia of humans from apes, but also the evolutia of single-celled organisms into complex multi-celled ones. Now, evolutia may potentially explain the how, but so far nothing has fully explained the why. As in, why did life first spring up from the primordial soup? Well, the answer is, I have no idea. And for some, that's where God steps in. But I'll tell you as soon as we have it figured out. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be mostly clear and warm with a low of 78 or 26 degrees Celsius. Then over the weekend, you can expect partly cloudy skies and a slight rise in temperatures to a high of 88 or 31 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.61 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV, and don't forget to follow us on Facebook at Israel English News and on Twitter at ILTV News. I'm Aaron Forrest. Thank you for watching.